So guardian angels, yes. Guardian angels, a lot of people in the paranormal world will call them spirit guides. And I had a little bit of a hard time wrapping my head around this at one point. But after having found out who my spirit guides were and then having three mediums on three separate occasions, unbeknownst to each other, without me telling them anything, telling me the exact same thing, um, I'm, I'm a believer. So here's how you find out who your spirit guide is. And this is something we always, t- you know, people will tell this to people at residentials. But the way you find your spirit guide, basically what you're going to do is clear your mind so that you're open to hearing them. So here's the process. What you do, and don't do this bef- as you're laying down getting ready for bed because I did this and it took me about 35 tries because I kept falling asleep. <laughs> but you want to be someplace where it's quiet, where it's peaceful, where you can meditate. So you are going to imagine your happy place, wherever that might be. It could be the beach, it could be the mountains, the desert, wherever. Wherever you're, the pool. Some people, their happy place might be by the pool. I don't know. But you are going to describe your happy place to yourself. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What's the temperature? Um, Are there bushes, trees? What do the surroundings look like? You are going to describe this in full detail. And I've had people say, I'm not a very visual person. Do your best. It's yeah. kind of interesting. I took an elective in hypnotherapy, and they use a very similar technique. Yep. It's yep. all about visualization. Yep, and just clearing your mind of, of you know, what am I going to make for dinner, and i got to pay that bill. and and um, So as soon as you just completely envision this happy place, you're going to look down, and you're going to see a path. Describe the path to yourself. What's it made out of? How wide is it? You know, is it straight? Is it windy? You get the idea, right? Just keep, as soon as you've described this path and you feel like you could about touch it. And there's no right answer. No right answer. Okay. This is just all of what you're doing. You're, yeah, you're creating this pathway. So as soon as you have described this path to yourself, you're going to walk down it. And as you're walking down the path, what do you see? Are there trees? Are there buildings? Are there, you know, is there grass? Are there animals? Are there bugs? Is the wind blowing? What's the temperature like? Again, describe everything that you're seeing as you're walking down this path. This is about where I fall asleep. It's hypnotic. (laughs) I mean, by definition, this is hypnosis. Exactly. So as you walk down the path and you've described your surroundings to yourself, you're going to come across a dwelling. And I think we all know where we're going with this. You're going to describe this dwelling to yourself. What does it look like? Does it have doors? Does it have windows? Are there stairs to get up to it? Is it? Are there vines growing off of it? Is it made out of glass? Is it made of wood? So on and so forth, right? As soon as you've described the dwelling to yourself, you're going to see a door because dwellings have doors. And you're going to go knock on it. Now, if you're someone out there I know is going to is going to contact us and go, oh, my dwelling was a hut. There's no door to knock on. Well, smart Alec, knock on the side of the knock on the side of the cave. Okay. It's made out of straw. <laughs> okay. Little somehow, pigs, little pigs, <laughs> let straw. me in. Somehow, you're going to alert <laughs> the people inside the dwelling that you are there and you would like to speak with them. Okay. You ring a bell. I don't care what you do, but you want to have someone come to the door and talk to you. When they open the door, when they come to the opening in your cave or pull back the straw, whatever it is. Work with me here. Um, talk to them. So I'll tell you briefly, when I went through this process, my happy place is more kind of a mountainy area. Um, my you know, kind of dark and green and overgrown. And my my dwelling is kind of a think of a think of a think of a little logish shack with greenery over it like you might see in a fairy garden. Okay. That's how my brain works. So I knocked on the door. And my spirit guide, who, if you've met me before, his name is Charles. It's not his real name. He won't tell me his real name, so I I named him Charles. He's not too keen on it, but if you don't tell me your real name, I'm not going to call you Hey You. So That seems to be a common theme amongst angels and demons. Yep, they do not. Is not not giving their names. They They don't 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 reveal their names. So so he's okay with it, and he actually kind of chuckles about it now. But he opened the door. And I don't want to go into a lot of detail because it's kind of personal, but based on, there's two women that are also my spirit guides. Based on a few things, um, I I saw those two women and I knew that I did not come up with this idea. It's not something that I, because the whole time I'm doing this, there's this nagging thought in the back of my mind going, I'm just making this up. But based on what happened when Charles opened the door, 
I was like, I did not make this up because I would have not have come up with, with what's going on right here. And, and don't worry, it's nothing creepy. And so he and I had a little chat and, and everything was good. So I knew of the three of them. And then on the separate occasions that I spoke with the mediums that I told you about, they each, each of them independently said, you actually have a fourth. It's another man. And he just kind of comes back and forth. And he's probably the one that comes and says, y'all good? Y'all good? And they're like, do you see who we're assigned to? No, we are not good. And he probably laughs and then leaves. And they're like, what the heck? So um, that is how you find your spirit guides. So out of your four angels, would you say Charles is in charge? Yes, that's good. <laughs> that is really good. Bad joke. All right. <laughs> Yes, he is actually, he's, he's in charge. He's very, very alpha male. Um, of your days and your nights? Of your wrongs and your rights? You got to sing this. No. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to hear me sing. <laughs> if you don't know what he's talking about, there's a show called Charles in Charge, which is amazing. Yeah, if you didn't catch that reference, I think we dated ourselves in an extreme way. Okay. <laughs> We're not old, we promise. Yikes. So... um. Yeah, Charles is, he's, he's definitely the spokesman. Most people have more than one, but there's only one that's the spokesman. And just FYI, your spirit guides always hang out on your right side. If you tell me that your spirit guide is on your left side, again, you need to reassess some of your life choices and get that fixed. So there you go. Spirit always guides. the right side. Yep. Interesting. It's good to know. There's something else that I had found um, that looking through about that. There, we talked about earlier that there's only two of the arch, or angels that are mentioned in the Bible, is Gabriel and, and Michael, but there are two fallen angels also mentioned in the Bible. Okay, I know one, but I don't know the other. Okay, who's the one? So Lucifer, Satan. Yes, you got him. And the other is Abandon, A B A D D O N. Or in Greek, it's Apollyon, A-P-P-O-L-Y-O-N, and that's in Revelations 9-11. And he is the destroyer, and he guards the, the, the bottomless pit. And he is mentioned by name. So there's four, two, two good angels and two fallen angels in the can canonical scriptures, um, you know, that, were, that came out, you know, our modern... Modernish Bibles. Right. Where so there is one more named Ish, not not necessarily a name, but in in Genesis they talk about the seraphim that guards the tree of good and evil. Yeah, and I'm, I wonder if that is an individual because I, I was wondering on that if that's an individual angel or if that's a type. It's a type of angel. When I took my angelology class, which sounds a lot more impressive than it. <laughs> than it probably should. Um, they talk about the seraphim being a, a type of angel. I was yeah. reading about cherubim and seraphim as different types. And an know. ophamin, O-P-H-A-M-I-N. I, -I -M. Don't, don't know that I know anything about those. I don't, yeah, that doesn't yeah. sound familiar. The, uh, the cherubim, I know, were placed on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Right. And were also placed in front of the Tree of Life. See, when we say cherubim, I imagine little roly-poly <laughs> baby angels. Super Don't. <laughs> Don't. The scriptures get in there when they talk about the cherubim. They are awesome. They, um, Daniel, you know, trembled in fear. All these people, they tremble in fear of the cherubim. Um, it's you know, been a and long they have time since you've had a two-year-old, isn't it? And they I've got <laughs> one. They're terrifying. <laughs> They're super cute. And they go all... All demonic. rogue on you. Go rogue on you. Uh, I was going to say the other places that they mentioned cherubim were in Solomon's Temple. Yeah. And in the Holy of Holies. And from what I was reading, the cherubim symbolized the presence of God, places where God dwells. Oh, I, I like that. that was interesting. Yeah, the, the Ophium, and I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. That's okay, because I pronounced all the angels earlier exactly correctly. And I didn't even try. <laughs> but, I'm but smart <laughs> like that. <laughs> but a lot of them, it, they're represented as two wheels that intersect with eyes all around everything. They're not even like humanoid. They're completely different. And then some of these other angels, you know, it says they've got like six wings and they've got wings around their feet and wings around their face and then two that they fly with. Right. And there's some really strange, I think it's in Ezekiel or Isaiah where it talks about it. The, the place in the Bible where the seraphim 
come up, at least that stands out to my mind, is when the people of God, the Israelites, I don't know if they were actually Israel at this time, were being bitten by the fiery, fiery serpents. serpents. Yeah, because they mentioned seraphim and, fly, and fiery flying serpents. So maybe that was the cherubim. I don't know. Fly, or the seraphim, flying, I don't know. Flying fiery serpents biting me sounds pretty scary. And then all they had to do was look at the brazen serpent to be healed. But and I don't know. Is that like their job? Like I said, they all seem to have some calling or office. Do Probably. the seraphim like come down and punish? I don't know. Right. It's like it's your job to do this. Well, then there's, you know, in Revelations, it talks about all the angels from the different, you know, the different eras and they blow their trumpet and bring forth different things. You know, you wonder, is that these archangels? Is that just, you know, generic angels? Do you sign up for that? You know, it's like it's your turn this week to go blow the, the trumpet at the earth. I mean, how does that work? No, they all got jobs. Interesting. Yeah, one of the things they talk, too, with these descriptions, a lot of theologians are, are these literal or are they figurative? Right. You know, and, and do they have meanings? Are these offices or are they individuals? So there's a lot of questions. I think the archangels are individuals. Is that, that's my vote. No, I'm talking about the the seraphim, the, the cherubim. Oh. The, the, yeah, the it would be really weird to have kind of two wheels with a bunch of eyeballs doing stuff. Yeah. That, that would be creepy. I I would be creeped out. Some of the artwork and descriptions <laughs> on it's like. Ooh. <laughs> I personally think that most of the Bible is symbolic, but there are I'm sure there are some literal historical events. But I feel like the deeper lessons that you can get from the Bible are more. They're in the yeah, they're deeper. They're in the symbolism of the Bible more than just a literal story. It's kind of like here's the story and, and this happened. But yeah. if you look a little deeper, you can learn more stuff. Right. Don't get don't get thrown off by the wheels and the eyeballs because you might miss the point. <laughs> I'm not sure what the point is, but I'll keep digging. <laughs> <laughs> wheels on eyeballs are kind of weird. Seems weird to me. <laughs> it's like I can't quite wrap my head around that. But I tell you, if, if a wheel with eyeballs came rolling towards me and it said do something. I'd probably listen. <laughs> I'd probably <laughs> yes, do it. Yes, thing. <laughs> now, now Sir, <laughs> ma'am. <laughs> one of the things that was kind of interesting was a depiction of someone. That, and again, you get into the ancient alien theories kind of thing. But is that a vehicle in which... An entity. It's a UFO. That's. Ooh, this is a whole different the podcast. Wheel topic. with the eyeballs. Yeah, and and they showed some drawings of, you know, some possible conveyances that would be round and and again wheeled with eyeballs. Are and those... you're watching people being raised up to heaven. They're just being abducted. Exactly. Interesting. Interesting. And when you look at it, when we say eyeballs all over, are they video cameras? You know, are these literal, they just organic. Can't... Eyes, or or is this a, a way to or twinkly bright lights? Who knows? Yeah, right. Well, kind of like in Revelations, they talk about they talk about the beast. What, how do they describe it? It's like a locust, but with the head of a head of a grasshopper, or something with the head of a grasshopper. And if you read it now, and you think of like helicopters, and you think this could be a helicopter. Yeah, think of think of Isaiah and and some of these people trying to describe today in the terms that people of their time would understand. Right. Okay. There's some examples. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was like of a rocket ship. Heads like a lion and it shoots fire. And yeah, I could I could see it being hard to describe something like a tank, for example. Yeah. And yet, you know, they're seeing these things and it's like, okay, what? And it roars like a... <laughs> roars like a lion. You know, and, and so... They're seeing all these things, and, and they're describing them. And so these may be literal descriptions in the best terminology that they can do for their audience at the time. So are the angels aliens is the question, I suppose. It sounds like based on okay, let's go with Raven's this. experiences. <laughs> let's go with this. Are they extraterrestrial or interdimensional? Ooh. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they have to come from another star system. Right. Here's one for you. Because, you know, is that where the veil is thin? Is that a, a, another dimension in which is another realm that people I guess can it, cross does, it, it depends on how you just define alien. Yeah. Yeah. Is an alien to you someone from a different planet? Is it someone from a different realm? Is it something that's just not from Earth? Do they still count as humans? I don't know. We are we are we are delving into a different podcast topic. <laughs> yes, we are. But, but the idea, I mean, when you think about it, is this 
is that the realm that they come from? When you talk about angels and the invisible, you know, because God's the God of the visible and the invisible. And is that, is there a, you know, moving through? And as we die, do our spirits go to that other realm? Interesting. Anyway. Tune in for another podcast where we delve into this even further. <laughs> where we go off the rails again. Yeah, we- <laughs> <laughs>